fire cave the king stands waiting. The narrow legs of its undercarriage give it an almost delicate appearance. It has the air of a thoroughbred horse and watches the new approach of a new and unknown rider and wondering just how far to try it and generally be bloody minded. I sense this as I walk steadily towards her and in doing so I'm quite unable to analyse my feelings. How strange. After all, this should be the biggest day in my short flying career. It is the day I've been waiting for, the day I've been working for, and the day for which Mr. Hayne and Eddie Lewis exercised so much patience when transforming me from a schoolboy into an RAF pilot, and possibly a man. We'll have to wait and see on that score. <laughs> to fly Spitfire, the latest step to becoming a fighter pilot. Think of the hundreds of pilots all over the service who would give their right arms to have this opportunity. To be a Spitfire pilot. My parachute feels heavy slung across my shoulder and my helmet is tight across my forehead. The as yet unsecured oxygen mask flaps annoyingly in rhythm with my steps. Watching my approach, the two ground crew stay there. I imagine their conversation with one another. Another bleeding sprog. We always seem to get them on our kite just because she's a bit old. Wonder if we'll get her back in one piece. About time another crew had a bashing full. Ah oh, well, so six. <laughs> <laughs> I arrive on the scene with my parachute, without a word. The two airmen help to strap me into the cockpit, and the small door is shut. And I'm left to my own devices. No getting away from it. Totally on my own. Take my time doing the engine starting procedures. This aircraft has an undercarriage that must be pumped up and down manually. As I go through the rest of the engine starting procedures, I find myself not a little surprised for some odd reason when the Merlin roars into life at the first touch of a button, sending back clouds of smoke and a set of flame as it does so all a bit intimidating. The aircraft has become alive with feeling. It has a certain impatience to get into the air and on with the job, its natural purpose. As I start to taxi, I remember snippets of advice. View is bad on the ground, so when taxiing, swing the nose from side to side so you can see what's ahead. Then there was the warning, the CO's parting shot, the one and only time I ever spoke to him. <coughs> if you break one, there'll be merry hell to pay. <laughs> I reach the far end of the aerodrome and stop crosswind. For the third time, I do my checks. <coughs> I let off the brakes and slowly open the throttle. The power comes in a huge surge, deep and smooth. The acceleration is something I've never felt before. We seem to be charging over the ground and I'm still opening the throttle when the Spitfire hurls itself into the air, dragging me along with it. In truth, I don't know where the hell I am and there is no doubt in my mind that the aircraft is flying me and not the other way around. <laughs> it seems to be behaving pretty well though, all things considered. Height is gained rapidly. I revel in the sheer beauty of the scene around me. 
I look out the small cockpit over the cloud dappled sky, I feel an exhilaration I've never felt before. It's like one of those wonderful dreams, a Peter Pan sort of dream. <laughs> the whole thing feels unreal. I must be getting lightheaded. What a pity in a way that an aircraft that can impact such a glorious feeling of sheer joy and beauty has got to be used to fight something. <coughs>